really move the dial because compared to oil, it was so small. But one of the recent successes has in fact been Nigeria selling that much more to the wider region, some of the smaller countries where demand is never going to account for so much, but the fact is something is being produced that is being sold over those borders. And the question is, how do you then formulate policy? How do you bring about the best of those potential productivity gains, rather than focusing on perhaps challenges that are very difficult to cope with. If a country has porous borders, think of that as a wonderful thing for welfare gains and trade, rather than thinking about how you just lock those down a little bit better. People who want to have, who want to finance projects and finance um, infrastructure development and so on, looking inwards, um, what's FNDQ doing to develop that, that space? FNDQ, um, some of the things that um, Razia had sort of alluded to when, when she was speaking in her presentation and even here, is about building the right structures, putting the right structures in place, and that is what FNDQ is, is, is really about. Now, what do we see, you know, going forward as in, in the future, if we think that is going to sort of turn around at some point? And the answer to that, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I think is yes. But in the interim, what are we doing you know, to look at in-house? When I say in-house, it's within the country. And we have quite a few initiatives working on there. And one of the things FMDQ is really passionate about is support for economic development. So that is putting things in place for infrastructure. You know, that's going from power to road to even SMEs. And we, 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 have, we already have something in our economy, in our capital markets, and it's about bringing that out, bringing that potential out, you know, and and riding on the foundation that is already there. So, um, so talking about, I mean, without even talking about the initiative specifically, but uh, it's, it's about galvanizing the local market, you know, galvanizing the capital, if I can use that word again, in the local markets to actually build those, those, those areas. And, the main focus for us, or the starting focus for us, is around infrastructure. We feel that once we put those things in place, you know, have you know the necessary building blocks, like you said, and those things are sort of be used to, whilst whilst you know the foreign angle might not be to the extent we want it now, we can actually take advantage of the local potential that we have. Uh, Mary, how, how do you see um, the impact from your point of view in sec? What's your impact been on? Uh, responding to the requirements of, of the capital market and the economy as a whole as the apex regulator. The Securities and Exchange Commission, as you would all know, which I don't really need to say, but um, in base saying is that the SEC is the apex regulator of the capital market. And of course, to uh, for a capital market to thrive, um, there has to be the regulation, you know, there has to be uh, appropriate regulation, you know, to, to, to guide the market. There has to be um, reg uh, regulation to, to, to bring integrity and confidence in the market. So therefore, the, 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 the SEC, you know, as the apex regulator and uh, that, that, that um, brings about the regulation of the uh, capital market uh, provides an enabling environment, you know, for, um, uh, for both issuers, for the players in the market, both issuers and, of course, um, and, and, and other uh, participants as well, that is the, the, the capital market operators, intermediaries and all. You, you will know that regulation uh, gives confidence, it, it, uh, it gives transparency, you know, it gives integrity to the market. You will really say that regulation is the foundation of any capital market, without which uh, a capital market would not thrive. And uh, uh, according to IOSCO, um, the importance of a, the objective of securities regulation, you know, is protection of investors, ensuring that markets, you know, are fair, efficient, and um, transparent, and also that systemic uh, uh, risk are substantially reduced as much as possible. Without um, regulation, of course, there will be no market. You will not have uh, issuers wanting to come to the market to raise funds because there will be nothing to protect them. Of course, there will be also be no investors who would come to the market, you know, to also want to uh, invest in the market. And therefore, the SEC does everything to ensure that um, there's a, a stable market, there's a market with integrity, there's confidence in the market, and of course, the market uh, works in a transparent, uh, a transparent way. What are the ways that the SEC 
does this does this do registration of uh, the market intermediaries registration of um, of the institutions you know just like uh, you would have uh, the the platforms you know where securities are traded it does this with um, registration of um, of um, of the instruments which are traded in the market which is the securities you know for intermediaries they have to be strong intermediaries that are um, efficient they have capacity you know the capacity to to um, to do what they're supposed to do in the market, to give the advice that they're supposed to give. So the SEC you know, scrutinizes those who are allowed to play in the market. Because by the time they are registered, the SEC is really saying, in a sense, that these are fit and proper people you know, that can um, play in the market. And that they are also held out to the investing public as, you know, um, as uh, experts you know, in, in, in the field of, uh, uh, of uh, securities advice. You also have the registration of uh, institutions like the commodities exchanges and also the uh, securities exchanges, you know, who, who in turn also have their members as, era, uh, as SROs, who they also register. So you find that all of these give confidence to the investing public. It attracts um, um, investors to the market. And of course, by registering uh, the product, uh, the securities that are, are traded in the market, you know, a lot of disclosures are required, and these disclosures are the the information that the public need. You know, to give confidence in the market, to 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 um, attract them. You know, to want to come and invest in the market. And of course, all of these disclosures also are, um, open up um, the market for 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 the investing public. Um, what is SEC doing to ensure that there is consistency in policy as it applies to the, the, the capital market? Um, like, like you heard me, uh, part of the things I read out during the, uh, when I was uh, presenting the DG's uh, speech, the Commission currently has a 10-year master plan, which I'm sure Victor will be a better person to speak on, because um, he was the assistant chair of that committee. Um, the 10-year master plan uh, is um, expected to... Um, reinvigorate the capital market, if you will. It is uh, expecting to, to look at those areas that, I know that there are areas for quick wins, you know, capacity building, uh, infrastructure building, you know, looking at innovation and all of that. You know, that is what the capital market uh, master plan is really talking about. So we're looking that in the next 10 years, you know, that the commission will be um, really, really like Malaysia, well, grow up like Malaysia, like Brazil, and all of that. So that is what the, the 10 year master plan is really all about. Maybe Victor should tell me. Victor, what, what I'd like to ask, first of all, is um, in, in all the words you said, and I'm sure you have um, a lot of opinions on them, give us your opinion on where you think the Nigerian economy uh, is headed, um, what you think um, we missed in this year, what you think the master plan, and the ECMT um, both addressed in it that we should look forward to next year. One of the major things we have to look at for is the pivotal nature of the economy reforms that must follow what we're doing now. Because she also noted that the stock market is aligned with where the economy is going. What many people don't understand is that the stock market is like the nose of the economy. It smells things first before they actually happen. And therefore, when the economy is not doing so well, the stock market is the first place to reflect it. And of course, when the economy starts doing well, the stock market is also the next place that you are going to see it happening. I'm glad about seven things that she has said that at least put things in perspective. One of them is the fact that we, we're seeing this six trillion naira budget now, but what you should be very keen in understanding is the composition of the expenditure, because that is going to be key in what we do, for instance, if you were spending money developing infrastructure, that would be something that would be great for the economy because it means that when infrastructure, is, as, it's been, as you're spending money developing infrastructure, infrastructure itself becomes an enabler for the economy. So I think that was very important in what she said. Then we should also note something because a lot of people, no matter how low this market is now, it's actually very interesting to know that no matter what happens, 2016 will be a lot better stock market than it is this year. The reason is simple. 
we are coming from a very weak base. And some of the reforms that are going on, Mary has mentioned some that are going on in the, in the, in the capital market in terms of what SEC is doing. I always, I think at another conference last week, I, I, where people, where everybody was, you know, lamenting about what is not done, and I, I reminded them, maybe sometimes we should count our blessings, some of the things that has been done. If I tell you, in the last five years, there's a lot more reform that has gone on in this economy that people don't, you know, seem to notice. Apart from the 10-year master plan that was put in place, which is a major, you know, looking at everything that we are doing, comparing ourselves with took uh, three uh, emerging markets as, as an example. We were more, we leaned more towards the Malaysia uh, model because the Malaysia market, capital market 10 year master plan which implemented, you know, very, very, uh, in a disciplined manner, resulted in that economy almost fly, flying off the, off the hook. So we need to also do that in our own case. There are a number of things that we pointed out in that. In fact, the master plan was broken down into three areas. One is the literacy area. For instance, let's face it. The literacy level in our, or what people know about our capital market is still very, very infinitesimal. It's going to be a lot of work. I know a lot of people are doing literacy, you know, financial literacy all over the place, but there's a lot more to be focused on ensuring that we have far more literacy. Just like everything else, we have a huge area that is not being touched at all. The non-interest debt market, the non-interest, you know, it's just there, nobody's touching it. I mean, London, I mean, the UK raised the largest Islamic, you know, finance debt not too long ago in the UK. So we need to look at that. There's a, a huge opportunity there that we have not captured. And that was also a major part of what the Malaysian uh, master plan did in terms of it being inclusive. That is something that I think we should, we should look at. Now, having said that, let's go specifically to the 10-year master plan, uh, some of the few things that we need to watch out for. I think if we go you know, and implement it the way it's been put in place, there's no doubt in my mind that this market will see a huge growth. There has been, corporate governance is something that has now become, you know, five years ago, nobody was talking about corporate governance. Today, corporate governance is everywhere. So at some point, we expect to see traction in that. We're talking about, you know, literacy. We're going to see traction in that. And believe it or not, like I said a few weeks again, a few weeks ago, if you look at the composition here, and look at the people that are in capital markets today, there are a lot of capacity, a lot of well-trained, you know, particularly foreign graduates, but there's a lot. The rules are better today than at any time before. We have, we have clearer rules. We have better enforcement. All these things are happening. And of course, we're also talking about capacity in terms of capital. There's been a capitalization essence that just gone on. All this should go on. We don't expect results don't come just like that. So we should be a little bit more patient that if the right things are being done, and that whether we like it or not, the market is going to move towards those right things and will be better for it. Thank you very much. I understand the apprehension in Nigeria around the foreign exchange situation. It is extremely difficult when the one foreign exchange earner that you've had is subject to so much volatility, when earnings are down and no one really knows are there going to be any benefits to that liberalization. It can seem like a very difficult decision. But at the same time, there's a need also to recognize what it might be costing the economy in the meantime. And the basic problem is with a fixed exchange rate regime, if there's any growth in any economy, it feeds into import demand. Now, you may be able to control that at a micro level. You might say, let's really put more bank lending into these productive sectors. Let's really put more into agriculture. Why shouldn't Nigeria try to be more self-sufficient in terms of what it consumes? No good reason why it shouldn't be. Nothing to be faulted in terms of really trying to provide that productivity boost. But at the end of the day, there also needs to be a realization that if this economy is growing, import demand is going to be growing as well. There's no getting away from that. And part of what feeds into our forecasts, we're expecting higher growth in the future, and therefore potentially, even with oil prices coming back, maybe a deepening of Nigeria's current account deficit. 
which means it will be important. It doesn't mean Nigeria needs to have a currency that keeps on weakening. But if Nigeria can instill confidence in those elements of the investor community who are going to be putting money back into Nigeria, either longer term flows, foreign direct investment, investors who say, well, we understand that the currency may be opening up at some point. We think that the framework for regulation in the capital markets is sound. Nigeria is a place where we want to be invested. It's those kind of flows that will ultimately help to finance that current account deficit. If it doesn't happen, what is Nigeria giving up? It means that when it comes to the financing of infrastructure, the pace at which Nigeria can go is going to be determined by how much it can rely on domestic savings only. There's certainly a large pool of savings. There are many more Nigerians, more pension contributions. Nigeria is in a more fortunate place than many other comparable economies. But the pace of that growth will be determined by how much you can borrow from the rest of the world to finance some of that investment as well. So very difficult decisions, but the one thing we need to be clear on is that for any growing economy, we could talk about the composition of imports, but if there's growth, there's going to be a rise in imports as well. And that's a given which policymakers will, will need to find a way to navigate around.